Good afternoon, folks. Uh, my name is Sean Carnathan. I'm a partner uh, at O'Connor, Carnathan & Mack. Um, and I've been litigating for over 25 years now, and uh, about 15 of them have involved quarreling with insurance companies about coverage. Um, and as, our, uh, as Mike mentioned, I wrote a, a book on the, on the topic, which uh, uh, I recommend to you all. Um, we're all uh, disappointed that Judge Davis can't be here today. Uh, he, uh, he would have been wonderful, um, but uh, he did entrust me with his notes, uh, so I will be channeling his thoughts to some extent. Um, he, uh, he gets a double uh, disclaimer on this, I think. Um, he always, any judge would, would issue the disclaimer that the views expressed are only his, his own. He's one of 82 Superior Court judges, uh, and nothing that I might uh, paraphrase from his notes you know, is, is going to uh, have any impact on what the court might do in the future. Uh, and of course, because I'm going to be either reading notes or paraphrasing them, I think he gets the double disclaimer. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm pretty excited about our panelists here today. Um, to my left uh, is Marty Pence. Uh, Marty's a partner at the firm Foley Hoag, um, and he's been uh, focused on representing policyholders in coverage disputes for, I think something like 30 years, right, Marty? He might be more than that, so let's stay at 30, yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> so he's going to have some good things to say. Uh, Marty's is in chamber, uh, Marty is in Chambers USA, best lawyers in America, super lawyers. Uh, he's a fellow of the American College of Coverage and Extra Contractual Counsel, uh, former co-chair of the Boston Bar Association uh, Insurance Tort Litigation Insurance and Reinsurance uh, Committee, uh, and Marty is going to primarily uh, uh, represent, I guess, the policyholder viewpoint uh, here this afternoon. Um, to his left is Dan Tai. Uh, Dan is a partner at Donnelly, Conroy, and Gelhar. Uh, and Dan also, I think, has perilously close to 30 years of experience. Uh, and I've known him for over 20 of them. Um, Dan, I, I know, has at times taken the plaintiff's side, but most of his practice uh, involves uh, defending insurance companies, and so uh, Dan is going to uh, primarily represent the uh, insurer point of view here today. Um, Dan's been in uh, Super Lawyers every year since 2005, and he's the current co-chair of the steering committee for the BBA's business and commercial litigation section. Uh, and I was teasing him earlier, but I will note that Dan in particular schooled me about the use of contention interrogatories. Uh, in a case uh, where we opposed one another a couple of years ago. So, um, so uh, with all that said, um, our plan is to try to divide this into topic areas um, which have a way of sort of interweaving. So we're going to try to stay in our lanes as we work through the various uh, concepts, um, but they will doubtless, uh, as I say, interweave. Um, sorry, I thought they were going to. Sorry. I, I know they thought we were going to use the podium, but that just didn't really suit our agenda here. Um, so we are going to start uh, by talking a little bit about the claims file, which of course is the sine qua non uh, in any bad faith uh, insurance uh, uh, coverage litigation. Um, I'm going to turn things over to Marty initially, who's going to talk a little bit about the policyholder perspective uh, on the discoverability of the claims file. Thanks, John. Um, and before I get going, I want to uh, give a ringing endorsement to this book, Massachusetts Bad Faith Insurance Litigation. It is on my shelf. You can see it's heavily dog-eared and, uh, uh, and post-noted, or if that's a verb, it's uncertain it isn't. Um, and uh, just the footnotes alone, which I think I counted once at 700 some odd, um, just a, an incredible resource for um, uh, references to case law, great parentheticals about what the various cases were about. Uh, terrific, terrific book. Um, just to further refine what I do be because of a, a fairly important distinction here in the bad faith arena is that I represent policyholders in coverage litigation uh, and before coverage litigation, um, indeed even in some matters that don't go to litigation. Um, but what I don't do, or have done only very rarely, is represent claimants. 
uh, in bad faith litigation, right? So my coverage cases will often, though not always, involve both a contract element and a bad faith element representing the policyholder. Um, but the best law uh, in this area tends to be made where um, highly sympathetic claimants uh, come after insurers either based on uh, a reach and apply kind of approach or um, hearkening to an SJC decision from earlier this week that has interested me a lot, but I haven't been able to get all the way through it, um, the situation where there's an agreement for judgment to enter against the defendant, but where the execution on that judgment would be only as against insurance. So those cases where the claimant is the plaintiff are very important in this field, and Sean could speak um, for quite some time on that. Uh, but my, my perspective is really just the, the, uh, the in the trenches for policyholders against insurers. Um, so having said that, the claim file is indeed um, the, the crux of the case as against the insurer. Um, indeed, coverage litigation tends to be a very, very skewed playing field where almost all of the uh, compliance with discovery is on the policyholder side. Uh, but the one thing that you almost always are entitled to and will get and should pursue from the insurer is the claim file. Um, certainly, insofar as there are bad faith issues in the case, but in any coverage case, um, and particularly the, also those that in, include defenses that are based on the conditions in the policy, such as uh, notification of claims or suits, uh, cooperation with the insurer. So the claims file um, is almost always relevant. I, I would say it is always relevant, and it should always be produced. And it's not difficult for the insurer to produce it, with one caveat that I'll get into, having to do with the sort of the definition of the claims file, what it includes. Um, but uh, it is usually a fairly identifiable thing, and it's not burdensome to produce it. The, the thing that, that will consume some time and effort on the insurer's side will be deciding which, if any, components of it or, or which lines from a given document uh, will want to be uh, subject to claims of privilege, and that'll be a significant part of our discussion uh, as we move through the topics. Um, so from the policyholder perspective, what the claim file does is it provides a roadmap of the insurer's conduct. It shows what the insurer did, and often equally importantly, what it did not do. And what it did not do obviously can be highly relevant to um, the various bases on which an insurer can be held liable for uh, bad faith conduct under 176D or just more generally under Chapter 93A. Um, when you look at the, when you get it and you can look at the, uh, the claim file, uh, you scour it to identify the cast of characters who have had a role in the handling of the claim for the insurer. Um, the, 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 the job description of um, claim rep at an insurance company is one that, uh, surely there are exceptions to this, but I, I find generally uh, has, has not over the years attracted people who become you know, highly refined in their expertise and stay with the company a very long time. It's common in my cases to see a file where there's been a, a, a train of different claim reps over time, four or five or six. Uh, and, you know, in, in the course of discovery compliance, um, perspicacious counsel for the insurer will generally determine which of the group of six that were on the case and that are still with the company, oftentimes they're not, um, it presents best. Uh, I think one of the things you want to do as the policyholder, at least insofar as there's a significant enough claim to justify the uh, litigation expense, is to figure out the role that each of those six, six people played and uh, not necessarily accept the face that the insurer wants to put in front of you, but um, figure out who all of them were, figure out where the weak spots are uh, and, and pursue people. And, and you can do that um, when you get a, a good production of the claim file and, and are able to figure out everyone whose fingerprints are on it. Uh, they also, as they uh, noted here, will, will show um, communications with underwriters, which will help you if you also want to see the underwriting file and the insurer wants to resist that on, on, on relevance bases. If, there's, if it's difficult to entirely distinguish between the claim and underwriting files because of communications back and forth between the claim and underwriting function, 
uh, then you're going to have a better chance of seeing that underwriting file. And we'll get later on to briefly discuss how that can help you in your coverage case. Um, I have found that there's nothing sexy about it, but you, when you really carefully review the, the, the claims file and you sort of figure out how the insurer actually handled the claim, because they are required to document what they do. I mean, uh, I, I'm sure Dan understands this a, bit, a, lot, a lot deeper level than I do, because I only see it on the policyholder side of these cases. But insurers have to document the file. That's, that's one of the things that you come to understand. And frankly, it can be very helpful to you in an insurance coverage case to understand that and to help the insurer document the file in order to get to a position where they can justify a payment on behalf of the policyholder. Um, but, but they do that. And that, for that reason, these files tend to be very, very uh, useful to the policyholder to figure out what happened because there's almost always a note somewhere about it. And you can create a script for your deposition examination of, of the claim handler from that, from that claim file where they'll be, you know, it, it's sort of the old um, Perry Mason thing. The best cross-examination is not necessarily the cross-examination where, the, you know, the witness breaks down and admits something. It's just the good stuff you can extract from a witness. Well, that's very much the case with claim handlers, even in cases involving bad faith, because you walk them through their claim file and they will confirm everything in it. And then that can be used in bad faith cases, not so much on summary judgment. It's pretty rare you'll get a 93A um, uh, summary judgment. I got one once. The First Circuit, circuit tipped it. They were wrong. But um, anyway, that's not very common. But for, on the coverage side, you can get a summary judgment based on, for example, if there's a late notice defense, based on what you've been able to demonstrate through an examination of the claim handler. So getting the claims file gets you that story, and it, it can be extremely valuable for that reason. Um, you should figure out whether the claim file reflects that the insurer adopted a litigation hold at any time. Um, why? Well, I think of two reasons for that. Uh, frankly, my clients are not always the sharpest, uh, particularly if they've hired me only later on in the game, I hope, um, at when, it, when that moment arrives, when they have to do the litigation hold. Um, and so sometimes you find yourself in a not so favorable position on having done that and the possibility of spoliation arises on your side, well, it can be really helpful if you can demonstrate that the insurer was no better, which I have done in deposition from time to time and then somehow a spoliation issue just never came up and that, that was just fine with me because I was a little bit worried about my own position. Um, the other thing is that wonderful confluence between uh, the work product doctrine and the, uh, the doctrine of when a litigation hold has to be put in place, namely when you reasonably anticipate litigation. So if you can establish through the claim file that um, the, uh, and through the privilege log that you require from the insurer uh, in discovery, if you can establish that the date the, on which they are saying they first came to anticipate litigation for purposes of asserting a work product objection is way earlier than the date on which they adopted their, uh, their, their, their uh, litigation hold, they've got a problem. Either they adopted the litigation hold too late and they've got a spoliation problem, or they didn't actually, they can't sustain their work product um, uh, assertions with respect to many of the documents that they're trying to withhold because they've already asserted at, by the date on which they adopted a litigation hold when it was that they came to anticipate litigation. So getting the litigation hold is helpful for those reasons and for one additional one as well, which is that um, if they have been careful about it, they'll have a list of custodians to whom the litigation hold was sent um, that will give you your cast of characters because, you know, uh, taking action which was designed not uh, for advocacy but to protect themselves, they may be more thorough in disclosing who was involved in the file um, than they would otherwise be. Um, I think it's fair to say that the litigation hold in its entirety may that is, that portions of the litigation hold may be privileged, the, the effectively advice of counsel with respect to what their obligations are, but the list of folks to whom it went clearly is not because you'd get that same information on a privilege log. 
So, okay, it all seems simple and highly useful. What are the problems that you face? Um, one is the, the question of what constitutes the claim file. Um, I, I've, I've asked insurers for claim files, and they've responded by saying that my request was vague and ambiguous, so they can't respond, which is a little silly, because they, they themselves always talk about the claim file, um, both in their internal dealings and in litigation. But it's legitimate in the sense that um, there are boundary issues about what constitutes the claim file. You know, it's not, in the old days, it used to be a couple of manila folders, uh, unless it was a huge case, then it was 10 or so manila, manila folders, and it would actually say claim file on it. Um, but these days, um, it's, it's, a, it's a broader array of documents that really actually uh, constitute the claim file. So you've got that paper file, um, then you have something called an, a, a diary, which used to be a paper thing as well, but these days tends to be electronic. Uh, again, Dan would know more about that than I, but I have encountered them in deposition. Um, and, and it has happened at least once, and I think maybe more than once, that I will get the paper claim file in, in the insurer's uh, compliance with my production request, and then I will get the diary the day of the deposition of the claim handler, because during the preparation of the claim handler, of course, the claim handler me mentions to counsel that, oh yeah, I mean, the, we have this diary thing. And so you, you get it on the day of the deposition, which can be frustrating, but you, you do what you can despite that. Um, you know, it, it becomes a part of the roadmap that you just deal with in the moment. Um, so it's important that that is included. Um, and there are, you know, obviously, uh, just as we in our law firms have document management systems, um, so also do insurers. Um, they're huge, I assume, at least for the large insurers. Um, all of those things you need to try to understand how they could contribute in substance, what amounts to the claim file, even if it's not in that labeled file that the insurer first thinks of. Um, so you, in discovery, you, there are ways of, of dealing with this. Um, in my production requests always ask, you know, in terms for the claim file and, and even defines it. But then I have several more that sort of break down the components of what I think from experience typically is in a claim file, and I ask for those as well. So there's really sort of no way around it. You get them from both, both perspectives. Um, I think it can also be important, e even with the, the really helpful um, definitions that we now have uh, in, I guess it's Superior Court Rule 30A1C. Um, if I got that right? I think that's right. But anyway, the, the, we now have definitions that we are automatically part of our, our paper discovery. Um, it, 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 there's nothing to prevent you from being very specific in your requests that you want electronic and not just paper uh, uh, files to constitute the uh, portion of the claim file. Um, and I think I'm going to stop there because I think we come back later to this question of reserves. I think reserves will tend to be a part of the claim file, although they may be, the evidence of the reserves may be elsewhere also in the insurer's uh, various ways of maintaining uh, ESI and documents. Uh, but I think we, w whenever we reach that, I have just a couple of observations I can come back to. Thanks, Marty. Um, so let me, let me start just with a couple high-level points to make. Um, one is to echo Marty's recommendation of Sean's book, which is a terrific collection of really all the authorities that you'll, you'll, you could ever uh, want to, to, uh, to look at when you're looking at discovery and 176D cases. <clears throat> the, second, uh, <laughs> the second great resource for this is Judge Gantz's decision in the Rhodes case. The, before Judge Gantz was on the SJC, he wrote a decision in the Superior Court. It's called Rhodes, and it's included in the materials today, but it's kind of a... Um, a, a tour through all of the discovery issues that you'll bump into in bad faith um, litigation. So um, between those two things, if you have those on your bookshelf, you'll, you'll be in good shape um, for, for these, all these issues. And let me also just say um, a couple things about 176D claims generally. Um, <clears throat> there are, I think everybody knows this, but it's probably worth saying. There, there are really two flavors of these cases. One is the first party case, which is the policyholder has a dispute with the carrier. I call those first party claims. Um, and so um, coverage cases are a subset of those, but I must say I really view those as 
plain contract cases. I mean, sometimes there's a 176D component to it. I'm not saying that there's never been uh, uh, bad faith in a coverage determinations. Surely there has been. But it's really a different kind of case. And um, there, there are a lot of variations to all of this. But that kind of case, a first party case where the policyholder is upset about a coverage determination, very, very different than a third party case where a claimant is bringing the case on 176D. Um, and really, all of the, all of the general observations we're going to make about discovery, they're, they're going to vary a lot depending on whether it's a first party claim or a third party claim. So just with that out of the way. So a lot of times I think what, as we talk about this we'll say well it depends on what kind of case it is and it's, it's, a, it's a very important distinction. Um, so as for the claims file, <laughs> let me begin by saying that um, the, the first issue that comes up in the claims file is a timing issue and that is when will it be produced? Assuming it's relevant, when will it be produced? So let me stick for a moment with a third party claim. So the typical case you see is um, somebody's injured. Um, it could be a construction accident, auto accident, but they sue a policyholder. So it's a tort claim, essentially. Now this could be a, it could be a contract claim as well, but let's say for our sake it's a tort claim. Uh, that's, that's a third party claim and they may also quite often at the same time bring a 176D claim against the insurance company. So it's claimant versus policyholder and insurance company. Count one is negligence, count two is 176D slash 93A. Um, if I were advising the insurance company in that case I would almost always move to sever and stay the claim and just argue to the judge that there's no need to get into the claims file because guess what? If the policyholder wins the case or settles quickly and reasonably, there is no 176D liability. It all goes away and we, and we should never be involved in discovery of the claims file. Um, there's, uh, for the most part, that's a practice that I think is followed by at least the superior court. Um, there is some contrary authority, but for the most part, that's an argument that superior court judges are used to seeing. Uh, it doesn't mean it always will win, but it's generally well received. Um, so, so the first question, um, if I'm representing an insurance carrier in a third party case, um, that I would say is, well, why do I have to produce the claims file now? Let's, let's see what happens with the tort claim. So putting that issue to the side, the next question is relevance. Um, I can imagine a case where the claims file is not relevant, okay? I don't, um, Mar Marty has, and I'm not a coverage lawyer, so Marty, I would defer to Marty there, but, um, but I could imagine if it's a straight coverage case, that's just a contract case, Judge. Take a look at the policy, take a look at the complaint. Does it state a claim that's covered or not? Why do you need to get into the claims file? Um, but I, uh, of course, that would depend on a lot of, uh, a lot of facts. But for a standard 176D case brought by a third party, so let's, let's now assume we're a little bit down the road and the, and the plaintiff has prevailed in the tort claim against the policyholder. Um, the highest settlement offer was a million dollars and the plaintiff recovered a verdict of three million dollars. So now, you know, the, 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 the facts are aligned such that they're going to bring a 176D claim against the insurance company. Maybe it was stayed and the stay is now lifted. Okay, and you're going to have to produce the, the claims file. Well, for sure the claims file is the most relevant document in the case. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Marty just said. Um, and it, for all the same reasons Marty just described it, but from the opposite side, I think as uh, someone who defends uh, insurance companies, I mean, these are really typically very difficult, complicated cases. Now, not always, but often they are. Uh, and, and with a little luck, the claims file is going to reflect that complexity. So in a perfect case, the claims file will be full of entries about different events in the litigation, uh, about what, what does an expert say, uh, what, what happened at a deposition, um, and it's well documented. Um, there, there will be things to fight about in that claims file, uh, no question. Um, there always are. Um, and you just have to sort of accept that is, that is what 176D liability is about. It's second guessing, knowing that there was a $3 million plaintiff's verdict, 
you can go back and make a claims adjuster look kind of bad for making a million dollar offer. Um, so with a little luck, the claims file is going to help you go back in time to that period of time when the claims adjuster didn't know what the verdict was going to be and didn't know, all he knew was what the last two deponents said or what the, um, or what the pleading said or who the judge was or what the jurisdiction was. So all those kinds of things are very, very helpful actually. Um, in any event, you're going to have to produce the claims file. Now, every lawyer, um, when, you, when you look at a document like that, your first instinct is to be as guarded as you can. We all would do that to protect our client because it's, you know, it's better, uh, our instinct is, it's better to keep that uh, information um, out of the public view if you can, if it's ambiguous and if it's, if it's awkward. And all I would say about that is, um, and, and, of, and of course you have to do a very careful examination of privilege issues, We'll talk about those in, in just a moment. Um, but um, the temptation is to redact like crazy in a claims file, right? Because you can make an argument that many, many entries in a claims file are attorney-client privilege, work product privilege, um, fact work product, uh, opinion work product. There are arguments to be made about all those things. And again, I would refer you to the Rhodes decision because it, it you know, it really it explains where the, where, the, where the guidelines are there. But um, think about trying the case. When you're going to produce that claims file, think about how am I going to try this case? I have to put a witness up here and explain exactly why we made this offer on January 1 that looks so foolish on December 31. And the only way to do that is to put the contemporaneous claims notes in front of the claims adjuster and ask him or her to explain their rationale. If you've redacted that, um, if you've been very aggressive about redacting that claims file, that is a really hard task. You, you're, you're basically just asking the judge to take your, take your word for it that it was a good faith um, offer. So, you know, you really have to think down the road about how you're going to try the case. And if I have one observation about these 176D cases, it's that all too often, we really don't think hard enough about how we're going to try the case. And a judge is not going to want to see all those redactions. It's going to understand why you made the redactions, but you know, you're, you're trying to fill the space with a story. You have to explain each decision that was made along the way. It's really hard to do if you're, if you, if you're looking at a blank page that's just got redaction stamps all over it. Um, I will also say um, that early in the case, as, as, as Marty pointed out, um, it's just very important to understand what is and what is not in the claims file. And um, I, 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 I do think, I agree with Marty when, when he said it's kind of a silly objection to say, I, I can't produce anything because I don't know what claims file means. Well, we all know a little bit of what claims file means, but we just don't know exactly what it means. And so that's really important to understand right up front uh, when you're gathering the information, when you're producing the information, certainly when you're preparing witnesses about what is and is not in the claims file, um, why the claims person um, included things, some things and not others. So um, there's, a, there's a lot to the claims file that we're going we're gonna to circle back to as we get into privilege issues, reserves, that type of thing. But, um, but it's, you know, just to return to maybe the first point is, it is, the, it is the most important document in an insurance bad faith claims handling case. I just have two comments, neither of which are disagreement. Um, just with regard to the question of whether sometimes the claim file never gets produced um, and that's not a problem for the policyholder, yeah, that, that's true. That, that can happen. I mean, oftentimes a policyholder who feels strongly about their, their coverage arguments and doesn't see a need for them to be flavored very much um, will go ahead and move for an uh, early summary judgment right in on the coverage issues. Um, and if that is, is won, um, then um, an insurer might become far more amenable to settlement, even a settlement that assigns some value to that uh, 93A-176D claim that you also have in the case 
um, but which was not dealt with on a, on a motion for partial summary judgment. So in that, in that circumstance, um, you may never get to the claim file because you may get a settlement uh, before you really need to pursue it. Um, but, uh, and, and indeed, in one of my recent cases, an insurer um, was feeling frisky when I filed, it's the first time it's ever happened to me, they, they moved to dismiss. Um, and under the law, I think probably both in Massachusetts and certainly in the federal courts, um, if you refer to policy provisions uh, in your complaint, then the court will deem that to be an admission about the policy that will actually allow a motion to, to, to dismiss to be brought by the insurer by simply putting in the policy and then taking the allegations of the complaint. Um, <laughs> I responded to that with a with a motion for summary judgment, and fortunately, in that case, uh, if things went my way, and we never never got around to the claim file. The other thing is an important distinction between well, uh, re relating to this notion of moving to sever and stay when you have a, a case that has uh, two elements to it. Um, you heard of one of those, and we and there is in fact it's an odd kind of precedent in Massachusetts, but there's a single justice opinion. Uh, from the SJC that upholds the idea that the underlying tort claim should be done before you move on to the 176D part. That, I think, is pretty well settled in Massachusetts. However, insurers will also sometimes move to sever and stay a 93A bad faith claim in a coverage case uh, in which they will say, well, um, if there is no coverage, how could I have acted in bad faith in refusing coverage? Um, and will sometimes prevail. But there is no, to my knowledge, there is no firmly established um, uh, uh, you know, Massachusetts doctrine on that issue. And there are a lot of issue, a lot of arguments a policyholder can make having to do with just efficiency of preparing the litigation uh, that would cut the other way. Just a quick example, and then I'll pass it back to Sean. Um, if you have issues of compliance with policy conditions, which make the, the, the claims file highly relevant, um, was the insurer prejudiced and so forth, um, then you're going to have to depose the claim handler. And, and, and you, so you're buying yourself a second set of depositions in that second phase if you do a sever and stay there. And policyholders will often feel like, and this is the part that's probably not so legitimate, but nevertheless, they want to be going into bad faith at the same time as they're litigating coverage if the case is going to go to trial on both because they want to tar the insurer with their uh, not so terrific uh, conduct. There's a, there's a raised hand at the back. You want yeah, to we're going to try to hold questions for the end if that's okay. Just uh, um, we, we've got so much to cover and it seems so hopeless. So, <laughs> um, Dan, did you have uh, more comments on the claims file? No, no. Yeah, yeah. that's it, Sean. Um, all right. <clears throat> um, I'm going to briefly channel Judge Davis. Um, and so, uh, oops. Um, the, the concept was that as we, uh, after we had um, Marty and Dan speak on each topic, we would uh, try to put out a hypothetical, get the judge's take, uh, and perhaps have me offer a few of my cockeyed observations about, uh, about the topic at issue. Um, and so in this particular case, um, I had focused the hypothetical, and, and this is again all subject to the disclaimer, um, about the scenario that both Dan and Marty touched on, where you've got sort of an early uh, assertion of bad faith, and so you end up uh, litigating both the, in my hypothetical to the judge, <clears throat> excuse me, the coverage and the bad faith at the same time, uh, and what the judge's view was of uh, the sever and stay approach to the, uh, uh, to that situation. Uh, and the judge actually expressed a, a pretty fair enthusiasm, I would say, for uh, sever and stay. And, and his comments were, most 176D claims never get to the discovery phase. The preferred course of action under Massachusetts law is to sever and stay Chapter 176D claims pending outcome of the underlying coverage dispute. <clears throat> um, another less frequent course is to sever without staying. The course to take in any particular case is left to the court's discretion. 
Uh, and there are three cases in your materials about severing and staying. Uh, the first one's the Feynman decision from uh, Judge Davis, which is at the beginning of the materials. Uh, the Monty versus Senadella case and the Rodriguez versus Al Velo case are all in the materials. Um, and of course, as we kind of uh, talked about it, Marty pointed out that they are all uh, tort cases. They're all cases the, the third party claim being severed and stayed, and none of them are the policyholder first party claims. Um, so I guess my observation from what I've done is that I've had pretty good luck not even having the insurer move to sever and stay in policyholder claims. Um, and I assume they thought of it. I mean, these people were experienced. They knew what they were doing. I'm sure they made a conscious decision. Um, it suited me quite well. Uh, and perhaps it's just that the stakes weren't big enough to want to have to do two separate actions. I'm, I'm not sure. but. Um, at least from my point of view, I quite like not severing and staying when you're representing the policyholder. I mean, I, I think you get the opportunity, uh, <clears throat> if nothing else, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uncover admissions. Uh, you can find things in the in the claims file where the uh, the insurer perhaps recognized that uh, they had coverage problems uh, that can be quite useful. Um, so I, I quite like the. The not sever and stay. I'm sure the insurers feel differently. Dan looks like he wants yeah, to. Yeah, you know, I, I was just going to make two observations about this. So, in a in a first party claim, um, bring a coverage action against the carrier. Um, the, the two main reasons uh, to sever and stay are to to avoid the messy discovery of a claims file. So, for example, in a tort claim you have a defense lawyer who's representing the policyholder and who's representing the insurance company um, informing the claims entries, right? So you can imagine while the tort case is, pen is, is going on, if you allow discovery into the 176D case, you have to produce a claims file that may well have um, advice from the policyholder's lawyer. So one reason that motions to severance that in tort cases are allowed is because judges say that would really be unfair to, to make the insurance company pick. Because the insurance co company might say, I'm going to tell you what that defense lawyer told me. That's why I made the settlement offer I did. But then that's going to be unfair to the policy. <clears throat> so, or, or conversely, the insurance company might say, I'm going to preserve the privilege. I'm not going to tell you anything that defense counsel is reporting to us. And judges say, well, that's unfair to the insurance company, because how can an insurance company defend itself if it can't describe the reports it's getting back from defense counsel? That issue kind of goes away in a, in a coverage case to some extent, um, because, well, for one thing, I'm not sure there always is a claims file, right? If, if the insurance company says there's no coverage, what's the claim? What, what are we fighting about? It's a, it's, you're back to a contract case. So the, the, the thing you're guarding against in most motions to sever and stay, um, it's, not such a, it's not such a big issue in the, in the, one, in the, um, in the coverage case. Uh, you know, it's just a different dynamic, I'd say. All right. Nice. Um, I have one other thought that I want to share with the group. Um, I'm not sure quite where this fits into the program, but it's something that's been on my mind lately, and I, it does fit into the discovery uh, topic. Um, super interesting case uh, came out about a month, six weeks ago, the Quincy Mutual Fire Insurance case. Uh, it was a Judge Burroughs decision, uh, 2019 U.S. District Lexus 125927, uh, July 29th. Uh, and so there's two things going on in that case that are near and dear to my heart. Uh, one that I bounce off of Marty from time to time, and, and he looks at me and says, I'll keep an open mind. Uh, but uh, I think that there should be 176D even in cases where there's no coverage. Uh, and the cases are pretty clear that that's not going to happen. That <laughs> the, uh, um, pretty much you've got to prove coverage or you've got no 176D liability. But I, I can come up with, with scenarios where I think it should happen. Uh, for instance, off the top of my head, where uh, the insurer does no investigation or a really cruddy investigation that's designed to conclude that there's no coverage, uh, leaves it to the insured to spend you know, two years and lots of money tracking down whether or not there's coverage, only to eventually discover there's not, but that was the insured's obligation. So it's a little hypothetical I think about from time to time. 
Um, the Quincy Mutual one is a little, a little different because it was an intra-insurer case where the, um, there was a personal injury uh, to a woman at a boatyard, and so she sued the boatyard, and the boatyard's insurer fomented a, a third-party claim against the insurer for her employer, uh, and there was no coverage through the employer's insurer, and basically the claim was, well, you, you should have known that. You should have known there was no coverage. And so it's a little variation on the no coverage claim, but, uh, but the idea was if you had done a reasonable investigation, you would have realized there was no coverage at the outset. So it's at least kind of in my box. Um, but where it fits into our discovery box, and this is something I, I think about during cases, is that I think that the insurer's duty of good faith extends beyond the commencement of litigation. And I, I'm pretty sure that's right. That's right. Um, and so if the insurer plays real hardball during the litigation, um, is horrible in discovery, you know, asserts 50 affirmative defenses that you have no idea what they're talking about, refuses to explain those affirmative defenses when you try to, you know, issue interrogatories saying, what does affirmative defense number 32 mean? And they, you get back some bizarre objection and then you have to bring a motion to compel to get the answer. And, um, but so if they're, if they're really awful, can you add that to your evidence against them as evidence of bad faith? Right? And there, there are cases out there that basically say that litigation conduct is not a violation of Chapter 93A. But what Quincy Mutual says is, well, unless you're an insurance company, uh, and an insurance company is a special kind of defendant, they're not an ordinary defendant. And for an insurance company, litigation conduct can conceivably violate 93A and 176D. Now, this is just a motion to dismiss. I mean, it's not... Um, it's not a roadmap to things, but it kind of fits into my, my concept. And, and I admit I've never gotten to a trial where I've tried to put on evidence of what they did to me in discovery. But it, it's always in the back of my mind. <laughs> you know? So, um, so that, that's one of my cockeyed observations that uh, I, I offer for your, your, your consideration. Um, can, I, can I respond sure. to that one? Yeah, yeah, by all means. So, so th th that is an interesting case. I think it's, it's kind of quirky and... Um, Sean's, I think, terrific about raising these these um, analogies and one step further. But um, I would invite everybody to think about how odd that would be if uh, it is actionable against an insurance company because a policyholder's a policyholder's defense counsel was aggressive in its defense of the case. Um, you know. Grant, the insurance company has an obligation to be fair, has an obligation to settle when, reason, when, when litigation, when our liability is reasonably clear. But if liability is not reasonably clear, just for the sake of argument, what's wrong with, um, with uh, obviously within the bounds of professional conduct, but that lawyer who's representing the policyholder is obligated to zealously defend the policyholder. That's his job or her job. So, um, so I, so I think that the, 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 quest, the, the point you're making, Sean, about litigation conduct, for sure, if liability is reasonably clear and an insurance company keeps instructing defense counsel, no, take another deposition, grind them down, that's a different category. But if liability is not reasonably clear, I don't think that litigation conduct is actionable or should be actionable because I think a defense lawyer has an obligation to zealously defend the client. Well, and just to be clear, I'm thinking about a coverage defense as opposed to a third-party tort defense, but, but I like your thinking. <laughs> so uh, I, I would be inclined well, you, you, up, you, you, so I would be inclined to um, point out another distinction, and I'm not sure that I'm pretty sure that Dan would not disagree with me about this, which is that um, it is not always the case that the handling of the underlying claim is over is history at the time the coverage action is happening. Uh, for example, and this is uh, unnecessarily confusing, I apologize for it, but another kind of first party, third party distinction is between first party property insurance, which often generates bad faith claims, between insurer and policyholder, not, uh, not claimants, of course, there is no claimant. It's a first party loss, that's why we call it that. Um, and then there's third-party liability insurance, uh, which is often the, the, the uh, subject of coverage litigation. We talk about the, 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 the tort case that um, we're talking about is the underlying case. 
particularly in the first party context, the adjustment of the claim may still be ongoing at the time the coverage litigation is ongoing. And if that's the case, then whoever's doing it, including if it happens to be the same lawyers who are representing the insurer in the coverage case, if they're handling um, the, the ongoing issues in the, in the cover, I'm sorry, in the underlying loss matter, um, then the policyholder's lawyer can be engaging them and causing them to take further positions on behalf of their client with respect to the, uh, the existence or absence of coverage or how the, uh, the property that's the subject of the claim is going to be handled or disposed of or what have you. Um, you can do a letter writing campaign with them and if they're making bad decisions, as they do sometimes, I, uh, I have no question that that can be a basis for bad faith. Um, I, you know, I had a case in which um, there was a, a, a huge loss arising out of a release of ammonia in a warehouse facility um, that was keeping frozen food frozen. Um, and the insurer wanted to say, no, 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 people would be perfectly happy buying that. Let's recondition it and sell it. And the policyholder was like, I can't, I can't let that happen to my reputation. Under the policy, this is considered to be damaged, even if it was just the packaging that got the ammonia on it. Um, and so we sued, but the, but the, the issue was still alive. The, the product was still sitting there in the facility. Something had to be done with it. And the insurer's attitude toward that was re reflected in, in letters of its counsel. Of course, letters addressed to me so that they weren't privileged. Um, but very much still a part of the bad faith claim. So that's, that's during litigation. Maybe it's still the handling of the under, underlying claim. Well, I would think it is, yeah. I mean, I, that's claims handling. Yeah. That's not, to me, that's different than, right. um, I think we're talking about maybe separate things. Here. Yeah. 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 All right. Let's try to move on to the next area, which um, <clears throat> Uh, obviously, we've already touched on it a little bit. I mean, the, uh, we, we tried to front load the, what we think are the <coughs> two biggest topics here, right? I mean, getting to the claims file um, and when, um, and, the, and the privilege issues, because the privilege issues are uh, pretty significant. Um, so with that said, uh, we'll uh, ask Marty to weigh in. All right. Well, um, obviously, this is not a uh, fundamentals of the attorney-client privilege and work product doctrine uh, program, so we're not going to get into that and we're going to assume you, you understand those things pretty well. Um, and even if you didn't, if you just sat down and read the Rhodes decision, you would. For purposes of this kind of, uh, of litigation, Judge Gantz did a, a marvelous job there. And I say that partly for partisan reasons, because most of his rulings were favorable for policyholders. I think you'd agree that, Dan, wouldn't you? Um, I just think they, they're good rulings. Though. Okay, they good. Make <laughs> What a big happy family. Um, anyway, so... Um, if that I'm, makes you happy, I'm happy, though, I'm Marty. definitely happy. <laughs> definitely happy. Uh, okay, so uh, the first thing is, as, a, as counsel to the policyholder, you always pursue um, the insurer's privileged assertions. And they are going to be with respect to the claim file, principally. There could be some privileged assertions. Um, Dan could speak to better than I about the underwriting file, but generally speaking, it's about the claim files. So we really haven't changed topics in terms of the, the, the object, just the subject. Um, and the subject is something that you want to pursue very carefully. So your production requests should explicitly ask for the insurer's communications with its counsel. So there can be no question that you're asking for those things. Um, it's fine if their response is to assert a privilege objection. That's what that's for. Um, but then you want, to, you want to make them prepare a privilege log. And, and the nice, one of the nice things about the claim file is that it tends to be, uh, except in the most complex of cases, a uh, sufficiently contained thing so that actually having the insurer prepare a document-by-document document privilege log is justifiable as opposed to, you know, categorical. Uh, I mean, let's face it. In litigation, there's always at least one categorical component of our privilege logs, and that is everything we've done since we started the litigation. Because, if, you know, you, you'd never finish the privilege log if you, just, if you had to keep on logging things one at a time. But with the claims file, it's a, it's a simple, usually uh, you, can, you can draw the line, and so you can, do, you can get that log, and you will get the subject matter of the communications, 
if, if they're in compliance with what a privilege log has to include, and you get all the recipients. And a large part of what we're going to be talking about here uh, has to do with how the, the various recipients of communications later claim to be privileged uh, will affect whether that privilege can be valid. Um, so this is a, another fairly unique um, aspect of, of the insurance situation where um, the function of lawyers uh, is constantly quest questioned. Fortunately for lawyers on the policyholder side, we don't get that much of that. <laughs> it's mostly for lawyers on the insurer side. And the reason for that is because lawyers are often used by insurers for functions that look an awful lot like claim handling. I mean, surely it cannot be the case that an insurer's business model is to um, collect premiums and um, pay claims where they should be paid uh, and thus uh, a need to determine when those claims should be paid. That's their business. Uh, and at the same time, by inserting lawyers into the function of determining, even in uh, cases that have not gone to or do not appear necessarily yet to be uh, likely to go to litigation, if they just put a lawyer in that seat, then all of their internal thinking is protected somehow by the, the, the privilege uh, or by uh, the work product immunity. Um, and courts have recognized uh, that um, when you have a lawyer uh, who is working with an insurer, particularly in the early stages of things, you have to take a careful look at what their function was. And if their function is very much more of a claim handler function of the person who deals with invest the, you know, running the investigation and making an initial determination of coverage before any, any dispute is necessarily arisen out of it, then many courts will find that um, they are not acting as a lawyer uh, in the traditional sense. They have not been brought on board to give legal advice it may happen along the way, but their, their primary function is to serve as a claim handler. And if that's the case, there's no privilege. Uh, and I think that Rhodes uh, supports that. Uh, so it's, it's a nice weapon to have in your quiver uh, to pull out Judge Gantz saying that this is, is, this is a functional question. And um, if you don't meet the definition of someone brought in uh, to give legal advice in the case of the privilege or brought in only at such time as a dispute was crystallizing in the case of work product, um, then you can get the communications with the lawyer. Um, well, there are various, I mean, Rhodes is your number one resource. I will mention just one additional case because it collects cases. Um, that's the uh, Connecticut Indemnity Company versus Carrier Haulers case. Uh, it's um, in FRD, so 197 Federal Rules Decisions 564 collects cases on, on that question. And, and certainly the cases have been all over the map. There's actually even, as I think I mentioned somewhere up there, um, a, a kind of lawyer uh, function for insurers that maybe Dan would, would like to speak to um, is neither coverage counsel nor claim handler, but monitoring counsel. Um, what I have seen is that sometimes if an insurer has a particularly large policyholder, say a big engineering and construction firm, and they're the professional liability insurer, they will expect routinely to have claims year after year under those policies. And, and therefore, of course, you get major premiums for that uh, and, and often retrospective rating programs that take into account claims experience. And they, they go out and they hire monitoring counsel to sort of keep track of all that. And they do reports called borderos. Um, I think that, I don't really know, frankly, coming in here today, I apologize for that, what the law has across the country said about whether monitoring counsel um, will, uh, that their, their documents or their communications will be eligible for privilege. Uh, but they're just another role in which uh, insurers tend to use lawyers um, and you, and it's, so it's very important uh, in your, in your uh, coverage slash bad faith case to establish the roles that the lawyers have. I've already made the point about the interplay 
the dangerous interplay between litigation holds and, uh, and assertions of work product. So I, I won't repeat that here, but it's, it's something to, to you really want to pay attention to as a policyholder counsel um, and also pay attention to whether you're in a glass house. Um, and I've also actually come around to making the next point that's indicated on the slide, which is that um, even your communications with opposing counsel in the course of coverage litigation can be relevant to bad faith. Um, I, I had a case where we, we did prevail on summary judgment um, on the coverage issue and then moved into a phase where we were um, arguing bad faith and we had briefed up a summary judgment motion um, which had to do with actually choice of law but we were able to weave into the choice of law uh, question uh, the, the conduct that we would point to as violating Chapter 93A. This is a case I filed down in the Northern District of Texas, uh, so the choice of law was, was a real issue. Um, and while that, those motions were pending, uh, the case settled, and of course I can't say how, for how much, but I will tell you that it was for an amount substantially in excess of the basic claim and in excess of the basic claim plus prejudgment interest. So you know the insurer was settling in part based on the uh, bad faith risk. Um, so another topic um, that, that is privilege related here is the, the degree to which common interest privilege uh, will apply and that arises in a couple of different ways. One Dan has already spoken to and I think I'm going to leave primarily for him to talk about which involves the lawyer who has been appointed by the insurer to defend the policyholder um, and the fact that their communications with both policyholder and insurer should be protected. Now this it's kind of an ivory tower issue. Um, I actually find myself in disagreement with Judge Davis on this one, so my opinion is worth not much, but there's a case called McCourt uh, in Massachusetts which is always cited for the proposition that a, a lawyer who has been hired uh, by, an, by an insurer to represent or is being paid by an insurer to represent the policyholder always has two clients. It's called the tripartite relationship. Um, both the insurer and the policyholder. And a lot of things will flow from that, including whether or not a common interest privilege will apply on a blanket basis. Um, and uh, what I would say about the McCourt case is that involved a firm that was uh, very robust when I first entered the practice of law, Parker Coulter. And Parker Coulter had a huge insurance defense practice. And what that means is they had a bunch of big insurer clients who would call upon them to represent their policyholders. And in that situation, it made a lot of sense for the SJC to think, well, naturally, because of the loyalty engendered by the flow of money, um, that, that insurer is the appointed lawyer's client. And, and what we want to do is we want to tell everybody, of course, also, the policyholder is their client. I mean, the notion that the policyholder could somehow not be their client is, is probably anathema to all of us at this day, in, in this day and age. Um, but it doesn't necessarily cover the situation where, for example, um, an insurer and policyholder have a dispute over the appointment of counsel because the insurer has reserved rights and has a conflict of interest potentially in wanting to steer the case toward non-covered grounds. In that situation, I think it's not at all clear um, that, in fact, the lawyer has two clients. I say they have just one and that's the policyholder. But the, the existence of common interest privilege will not necessarily hinge on this, is it two clients or just one issue. It is, an, it is sufficient that there is an alignment of interest. Um, and so there are two cases that I think you really want to be familiar with in this arena, and shockingly one of them is Rhodes, that's a 2006 case, but the other one that I highly recommend you become familiar with is a First Circuit case decided in 2012, uh, Vicor Corporation versus Vigilant Insurance Company, and that's 674 Fed Third 1. Um, and it was actually a case arising from a coverage dispute, 
and it involved a question of whether Judge Young had correctly uh, sustained objections asserted by a policyholder in the course of the coverage dispute to producing um, attorney-client uh, privilege communications and work product from the underlying case file where there was an, a dispute with the insurer over coverage. Um, and what that case stands for, um, I think helpfully, but it doesn't make life, sorry about that, it doesn't make life that easy, is that the truth of the matter, where an insurer has defended under a reservation of rights, is that the insurer and the policyholder will have zones of common interest, but also zones in which their interests are not common. Um, and what the, what the First Circuit said is this won't always be easy, and I could, there's a quote here, if we had time I might read to you, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure we do since it's five already, but um, that what they say is you've got, to, you've got to split things along those lines. So yes, there will be a, a common interest privilege that attaches to communications between defense counsel, whoever chose them, uh, and the insurer, where they're speaking to matters of common interest, but not where they are speaking to matters that are not of common interest. And the classic illustration of this is where the underlying complaint makes pleading in the alternative a negligence claim or a claim that, uh, that alleges deliberate infliction of injury by the policyholder, um, the latter of which would be excluded from coverage. So the insurer, in theory, has uh, um, a, an incentive to steer it in that direction, um, or an incentive to say, if there's been a settlement, well, you really settled this case because of your concern that they were going to prove you did this deliberately to hurt them. Um, in that situation, um, on all matters in the case that are just, um, you know, well, uh, on, on all matters in the case other than the question of whether or not the um, the the defense counsel evaluates a, a high risk that a, a verdict or a judgment will be returned that finds that there actually was this deliberate conduct to inflict injury. That piece of it is, his own, it is in a zone where the interests are not common. Uh, I think after Vicor, at least, you're at risk if you share that kind of valuation with your insurer. You're not only at risk that they'll then throw it in your face in a subsequent coverage case, which they certainly will do, but you're also at risk that it would be discoverable by the claimant, if the claimant still has any interest in discovering it, um, because it is an area in which there is no common interest and therefore no common interest privilege. So um, I highly recommend that you become familiar with those two cases on this question of, of uh, common interest privilege. A um, couple of other things to know about common interest privilege is that it is commonly owned, which means that neither the insurer nor the policyholder should be able to waive the privilege if they both hold it. Um, and therefore, there, there has to be, uh, if, there's, if there's a reason why it might make sense to waive it, um, there has to be a consultation between the two. And I don't think it can be waived unless both are willing to waive it. And then the other thing to understand, and I kind of adverted this to, to this a minute ago, is that as between the owners of the common interest, um, there is no privilege, um, which means that the insurer, if you did share the evaluation of that terrible point of what was the likelihood of success on the intentionally inflicted harm theory with the insurer, um, then you cannot turn around and try to invoke privilege against them uh, in, a, in a piece of coverage litigation. So that, that can be a really serious mistake. Uh, and well, just one more thing is, is regarding common interest, I, I commend to you um, the comments to Massachusetts Rules of Professional Conduct uh, 1.7, the, uh, the, the, the most important rule for private practice, which is conflicts of interest. Comments 29 to 33 talk about that in terms of what you have to disclose to your prospective common clients before you undertake the relationship and I think are very helpful to an understanding of this area. <laughs>